All right, good morning, everybody. Um, just quickly want to say thanks to Pete and to Paul for allowing us this sort of platform for, to be able to uh, discuss the session today. Um, what we're looking today doing or exploring this idea of, of disability and football and the relationship between them, um, disability from a larger point of view, but also uh, focusing on football and society as well. So the aim of this session is obviously to spend some time today discussing and providing a platform uh, for exploring this relationship. And that's quite important as well, not to downplay any other areas that have come before, but disability football is an important topic and it's one that should be you know, at the forefront of discussions around, uh, around our understanding of football and society. Um, so what we're going to give a quick overview now for a couple of minutes, and now I'm going to really throw it over to the panel. Panel, and all I'm going to do today is is, is ask questions and also um, take questions from people as well, and then help manage the the, the thing with Pete at the end if you wish. Um, so we're going to look at uh, how we understand disability and how it's produced and represented in society and in football. Um, we're looking around narratives of uh, disablism and ableism and how it impacts on how we we see uh, disability. Um, we're going to look at this concept of involvement, which is, you know, just trying to consider disability in football as more than just playing. Um, so this idea of trying to move beyond um, a disabled person as a service user, but someone who's a co-creator of the football experience. Uh, so this includes things like, you know, playing, uh, watching and working in football as coaches, officials, administrators or any other role that might exist uh, in the sport. Um, and then in the third part, the final part, we're going to look at some opportunities for action for research around this sort of area. Um, you know, so, so from this point, you know, really going to have this idea of uh, understanding disability as a starter. Uh, so over the next sort of 10 minutes, we'll explore that, that topic and I'll invite our panel to discuss this. Um, so I'm going to start with a very uh, you know, quick question to the panel. Um, you know, we looked at this notion of understanding disability uh, in football, would any of the panel members like to, to, to talk about this idea of how disability is represented uh, in football or in society that could be relevant for this, this sort of discussion today? Okay, I'll start. Thank you. <laughs> uh, to, to me, the key thing uh, is how disability is constructed within society and within culture. And, you know, myself and Miro, and I'm presuming Jason as well, probably work within something called the social model, which sees disability as a social construct. So my impairment is, is that I can't walk. Uh, disability are the social processes that exclude me. Uh, on, a, on a very literal term, if there's steps, it, I can't get in that building up because there's steps because I can't walk. It's because it was built with steps and that's how you're excluded. And so it's thinking about how the world constructs a disabled person as fundamentally an impaired person so it flips it around and uses it in a kind of very medicalized way and football for me you know i'm i'm knocking on 60 and uh, grew up through the 70s and uh, it's about how football constructs and participates in the social processes that define disabled people as other and often that's through charity and to me, football is very significant in, in facilitating the construction of disabled people as objects of charity, uh, both through the community foundation it works, it does, through things like half-time entertainment that it does, which, uh, which is, again, I've been to many a football match, particularly in a lower league, that are dreadful, where the biggest cheer is for a disabled person scoring a penalty for charity at half-time. Uh, which is quite disheartening, uh, although quite funny at the same time. So it's about that whole notion of construct, and football does it at multiple levels. And again, they don't all do it to this degree. But for example, fundraisers, uh, bucket collections, uh, wheeling out of disabled people at half time. And again, so it creates a barrier or a notion of otherness in relation to disabled people that football perpetuates, participates in, and facilitates others to achieve in a more successful way. You know, I've, I've had links with, with the local football club in relation to various things and, uh, and in relation to charity. And they're very keen on that kind of level of participation. But more than that, they also do it with ex-players. I think it's very keen how ex-players, fundraisers for them, so often rights uh, and kind of like the, the kind of worth as, as kind of in a kind of human rights term 
is often marginalised. And equally, it's things outside of football that link to football that do that. I think uh, Nero and myself, we do a, a film podcast on disability, which we'll give you the link later if you wanted it. But actually, and my PhD was in cinema. And there's a bizarre number of football films that hinge on the notion of a disabled character as being instrumental in the narrative thrust to construct it as, as a kind of model, a normative model, a kind of model of normality in relation to otherness. And I think that's where I start in relation to football and, and the whole kind of cultural representation of it from match of the day, right through to the big match, again, if any of you are old enough to remember that, uh, et cetera. And so that, that's where I start from. Right, Paul, thanks for that. Uh, guys, I knew I'd make one stupid mistake at some stage today. So um, it was not actually introducing the panel members. Uh, and so quickly, can I just try and wedge this in and then continue Paul's discussion by throwing over to Miro or to Jason. Uh, but uh, obviously, Pete, speaking to Zim was Paul Dark, who is, um, you know, CEO and of the or the founder of Outside Centre uh, Digital Disability. Uh, we have Miro Griffiths from you know, Teaching Fellow and Disability Studies at the University of Leeds and Jason Browning, who is proudly for us an ex student of ours, uh, who's just graduated this year, graduating this year, but also chairperson of the Lightning Power Chair Football Club in Northern Ireland. And apologies again, everybody, for not getting that in. Um, it can be edited so that that's put at the front rather than in the middle. I'm sure they can do that. <laughs> Sorry. So, um, should, I, should, I, should I just build on Paul's, on Paul's um, Paul Doc's comments? Yeah. I think I, you know, I, I, it's, it's absolutely essential that we do look, to, look more broadly at how disability is positioned and that gives us then a way of bringing forward the key issues within um, the, you know, the, 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 the subject matter of, of football. Uh, and this issue of, of the medicalization of the body is key because even though um, you know, Paul Dox highlighted this, the, the significance of a social model perspective, which is you know, deeply rooted in the activist networks associated with uh, the disabled people's movement um, in the UK and, and more broadly speaking across the globe. But what you've got is, uh, is uh, a counter narrative uh, rooted within the welfare state, rooted within the media narrative and discourse. Um, so any, you know, wherever you look in terms of education system, accessing health and social care, accessing the labor market, um, how disability is, is represented in media, it reinforces this, uh, this overtly medicalization of the body, which then leads to this narrative of, of tragedy and, and charitable responses to the issue of, of disability. So whilst there is a strong presence, then perhaps this is something we need to think about, how we link between the ideas and discussions that come out of things that we do as part of the football collective and indeed how we link that to the broader disabled people's activism and social movements who are trying to push back against that um that emphasis place on the on the, on the charitable because you've got the individual model this idea of you know focusing on cure focusing on rehabilitation focusing on care which again leads to that idea of, of passivity and dependency within the disabled people's demographic which you can see then reinforced through you know um some of the footballing initiatives in the community when they go and visit disabled children when they emphasize the medicalization of disabled children involving disabled people at half time as as a as a way of differentiating between inverted commas the normal and the and the abnormal in the case of disability um, and all of this is again is, is reinforcing special tragedy so i want to make the point that you know football is not um is not distinctly different from the broader way that's that society positions disabled people but I think now is a time that we can hope to use football as a lens, as an example, of trying to push back and challenge that. And that leads me on to, you know, perhaps we'll talk about it later, um, you know, this idea of ableism and disabledism in, in the football system, and more broadly speaking, and recognizing, on the one hand, the discriminatory practices that occur, which, um, you know, which, which exclude disabled people from certain spaces and practices, but how that's part of a broader notion of ableism. And that, that, that idea that there's a, there's a desirable way of being and functioning in society. And those who don't fit that are then either excluded or at least they are differentiated with different forms of uh, participation and inclusion. Great. Thanks, Mary. That's a, 
it's really interesting to build on those sort of points. Um, rather than identify anyone in particular, but would any of the panel like to sort of uh, sort of mention how some of those maybe issues around um, normative gazing has been experienced personally, um, things that have been done with that charity lens in place, probably you know, for a whole range of reasons, but probably good intentions are there as well. Something to, you know, to, to provide a... Well, for me, I sort of think it's kind of interesting that Miro mentioned, you know, things like the, the, the differentiation of your ability to others and the sort of tragedy element as well. I think that's that's quite interesting because that's something that I have experienced uh, throughout my life, and whether that be in a sporting context or otherwise, I tend to I tend to find that there seems to be some sort of uh, element of glorifying tragedy almost. Mm -hmm. So, you know, where obviously I'm a wheelchair user, so if I achieve something uh, of, of a high level in sports or in education or in other ways. I almost feel that some people view it in a in a sort of patronizing lens almost. Whereas they, they you know, they look at the tragedy that you're in and say, Oh, you've done so well to achieve what you've achieved or whatever and just because I can't walk, you know, there seems to be an overemphasis of achievement sometimes. Which obviously praise is a good thing. Obviously, you know, we we all like to be praised for, for doing things well, but there there is certainly from a disability perspective, in my opinion, an overemphasis on what you can achieve and what you have achieved. And I think uh, someone who who doesn't have a disability doesn't necessarily experience that same uh, experience that same environment uh, when they when they achieve certain things or reach certain stages in their life. So that's certainly something that I could maybe add to what Miro was saying as well in terms of the differentiation between. Uh, non-disabled and disabled people in sports and otherwise. And just to add to that, um, building off from Jason's point, again, yeah, you 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 see this this um, compartmentalizing of marginalisation and oppression experienced by disabled people. So rather than see the injustices, say uh, lack of accessible transport to get to football and grounds, um, the the position of of spectators, disabled spectators within football stadiums I don't just mean wheelchair users but you know anybody with access needs not having their needs taken um, uh, seriously or even indeed acknowledged by by um, the, the the club infrastructure all of this is seen as a way of of you know, for disabled people trying to highlight the barriers trying to highlight the the levels of injustice experienced whether that's policy led you know for example not providing um, sufficient information about um, uh, ticketing policies around disabled people and the support needs, or it may be about not recognizing the, the fact that the majority of disabled people are in poverty, and yet um, the, 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 um, the, the, the amount of financial income you need in order to participate by going to your, by going to your local football team can, can also um, create ways of, of exclusion, or indeed you know, access in the stadium in, 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 as, as a spectator, or participating in, 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 in playing sport. All of these issues highlight the, you know, the various um, uh, nuanced ways of experiencing exclusion, whether that's from the environment, whether that's from attitudes, whether that's from, the, uh, from policy making. But all of it is perceived as the, the most important thing is the individual triumphing over diversity. So when they do succeed, um, you know, so for example, for me, going to a football club, uh, paying you know, in excess of hundreds of pounds for a season ticket, uh, and people want to welcome me. Yeah, you know, again, that's seen as as kind of a oh, well done you for being being able to participate and be be part of it. And actually, it doesn't then engage in that broader exploration of the systems and structures which are denying so many people and their families uh, opportunities to to take part. And that's also you know a, 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 a also a deliberate tactic as well, because when you emphasise the individual's responsibility um, to um, kind of internalize their experience of oppression and then deal with it themselves in order to navigate those barriers. It takes accountability then away from the systems, the infrastructures, policy makers who should have more attention put on them in order to actually make the footballing experience a much more accessible and inclusive experience. And, and I would add to that, that often you have privilege so, it, you know, we often talk about exclusion, marginalisation and, and, and negation of worth. 
But one of the ways that that is also achieved is through by privileging you as a disabled person, uh, by giving you cheap seats, by giving you accessible parking right next to the stadium, giving you seats the better, that are much better than the average viewers. Uh, but that's still part of that process. And just because it's a privilege, you know, like I, I, one of the reasons we started going to Wigan, for example, although I'm not a Wigan fan, I'm a Liverpool fan, is, is that you could park next to the stadium, the tickets were cheap, and you had really good seats as a disabled person compared to say other teams where that wasn't the case. And so it's that also that notion of, of having extra special that's also part of that process of negating your, 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 your human worth. But equally, and I think the other thing to add to that is that it, they're processes that activate against the, broad, the broadness of society. So for example, as a disabled person, whether I can afford it or not, I will get discounted t seats. Often, if you're a working class person living in poverty, you have no access to discounted seats. And so there's those hierarchies there about class as well. And, and I think often, and, and again, the thing I would say is, is football isn't, isn't, isn't leading in this, it's following. And I think as, as the collective has this opportunity through the understanding and the education that it can bring, is to transcend that from following to leading. And I think that's where, where this starts for me. But I think often we seem to be terribly negative and we're saying, oh, oppression, oppression. But actually the notion of privilege is very important in participating to that. And again, class comes into it as well. So for example, if you are, most disabled people live in poverty, as, as Miro said, but actually most of us who go to football are fairly affluent middle class people because even though we're having privileged position through reduced tickets and all that extra access, uh, it is still very expensive for, for your average disabled person. And it can lead to resentment. I've had examples of, of resentment from other fans who see that privilege as being unfair and unjust and have been quite aggressive and unpleasant. Uh, just to give an example, I went to see Italy Ireland in Lille at Euro 2016, and it was a fascinating experience because the Irish fans were very upset at the privilege we had as disabled people compared to the Italian fans who could not do more to facilitate that privilege. And I thought that was a fascinating experience. But I, I think that notion of privilege in there as well as a marginalizing process is, is very important. And just to add to that as well, I think you know, that's also key. And when we think about the role of disabled um, supporters networks and those who are involved in trying to um, input either advice or commentary on trying to make the game much more accessible and, and, and inclusive. You know, often, again, this, this it speaks you know, much broader to tell people's representation um, on, on decision-making platforms more broadly. But you know, when you rely upon those with either minimal access needs or access needs that can be easily addressed by the responsibility of those who are hosting the, the platform of views and experiences, often then you get um, disabled people who through, through afforded a level of privilege are able to keep up and engage with the, uh, with the expectations set by those who are wanting to receive views or wanting to to um, consult with disabled people. So again, this then limits the the recognition of the you know the various factors associated with denied opportunities, reduced uh, opportunities to uh, have have voices heard, experiences. Yeah, you know, it's 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 not a surprise that you see that a lot of dis um, disabled footballing supporters groups are predominantly led by people with physical impairments. People with mental health conditions, people with learning disabilities are often excluded from those processes because of the resources and the support and making sure that actually the experience of participation is accessible to the diversity of access needs is minimized because clubs or you know, uh, footballing uh, institutions can say, well, we've got, you know, we've got representation. We've got the group of disabled people that we need to speak to. And yet actually those, those people that they're speaking to as Paul touched on, you know, that level of privilege then accounts for the, the, the dominant ideas and perspectives that come from, 
from those groups, which is, hot, which is problematic because a lot of the time when we talk about opportunities for change, we assume that by talking to small groups of disabled people, that their views are representative of the disabled people's community. And of course they're not. And of course they actually acknowledge the levels of privilege that we've been, that we've been highlighting. Well, I mean, that, that provides us a, a nice, you know, um, there's a couple of comments on CYD, this idea of involvement. Uh, Mira, you talked about this sort of idea of systematic and structural uh, barriers that, that people have become, but also all that interesting notion on, on the privileging of certain um, disabled people over others. Um, you know, I mean, in what ways through playing, watching or working at football is this sort of manifest? How do we see it? Uh, you've, you've touched on some good ones there for spectating, but... Um, Want to comment on any sort of things around the playing of sport, um, you know, or the, the working in sport in these sort of notions? Well, for me personally, I think it, it would be access to the club to some extent uh, it, as, as a kind of privilege that again facilitates that kind of notion of otherness. Uh, you know, uh, for example, uh, players going to visit special schools, players going to visit all of those kind of things. So it's just access to the whole supporter experience to some extent so not just the seeing it uh, as i've talked about parking and seating although i must say on seating for example often privileged seating is worse than the mainstream seating because it's designed by architects who think uh, football fans sit down quietly and have no idea that fans stand uh, which is just absolutely mind-blowing when you go to it uh, just off the cuff going to Juventus's brand new stadium, the disabled people can see nothing in their brand new stadium with disabled seats. It's just, you just think, wow, this is, uh, but you can tell the, the, the architect obviously is an opera fan. He thinks everybody sits quietly and applauds like that every time something happens. But I think that access to the, to the club is, is very key that Miro was talking about the privilege of the fans that you speak to uh, through, through that kind of, perpetuation of, of charity and tragedy. But equally, I think access to opportunities within the club as an organization. You know, I run a charity in Wolverhampton. We work with the social model. We minimize the notion of charity into that as just a practicality. But we have access to the club, our local club, in a way that other businesses and organizations don't because we tap into something that they see as legitimating their corporate uh, responsibility, for example. And I think that's a lucky for us and we utilize that as much as we possibly can. But, but I think it, it, it's that, that to me is another key way. I'm not, I, I don't know that much about employment within clubs. I'll let others talk about that. Okay. Well, I also think there's a tendency for uh, from my experience anyway, for football clubs to, uh, similar to what Paul was saying in terms of utilizing the, their disabled supporters for a positive sort of corporate image, but at the same time, their own practices in terms of accessibility and in terms of uh, disability inclusion maybe aren't up to scratch. So on one hand, you know, they'll be using it for a positive public image, but on the other hand, that you know, they don't actually practice what they're preaching sometimes, which is uh, obviously something that should be addressed going forward because on one hand, you can't project one image and then have something else entirely in reality. So, you know, I think that's important as well to mention that that, that, sort, of, that sort of privilege or that sort of positive discrimination that we sort of touched on um, can be utilized by clubs for their own gain, as what Paul was sort of mentioning, but they don't actually you know, go further and actually make a difference within the club itself, if that makes any sense. I can, I can explain further if that, or does that make sense? That makes sense. It, it, it does, Jason, it does. And I know you have some good examples around that. I mean, we don't, you know, we don't have to mention clubs in particular on here, yeah, yeah. but you can mention the, because I know, you know, Jason, before this, you know, the, the contradictions that you face yourself, and I, I think they provide good examples, so please feel free to share. Yeah, well, the, the club that I support, I've been involved in different PR projects and things that show, you know, how inclusive and diverse our supporter base is and how, you know, you know welcoming we can be to disabled fans and so, the sort of facilities that we have at our club. But at the same time, there was, there's been incidents where we've uh, won trophies, for example, 
and I couldn't then access the uh, the uh, what would you call it the the club bar or the club area uh, after the after the cup final with the players and stuff because it was upstairs. You know, and um, that's frustrating for me because obviously I, I can't access that and I wanted to and I, I know the players and I was actually invited to this after the game as well by the players. So to not be able to have to turn that down and say, no, I can't because it's up the stairs was a real frustrating experience for me, obviously, in the past. And um, I, I sort of, I got in touch with the club and says, listen, could you not, you know, change this to the downstairs facilities rather than rather than upstairs but they actually turned the downstairs area into a gym for the players so while I understand that the gym is important obviously but you know why couldn't you put that up the stairs in the space and have the corporate facilities down the stairs um, you know it's so it's simple sort of aspects like that which just a little bit of thought on the point of the club, as well as uh, more interaction with disabled supporters, can cause uh, solutions to problems that seem quite simple. You know, mm. and, and those for those situations, uh, the particular situation that I'm thinking of, is very frustrating for me, because I was, I was, as I said, I was invited by the players after the cup final win to come up to the the corporate facilities, to the bar, and to see the trophy and to, you know, have a crack with them. And, you know, I missed out on that because of the, of the barrier of the stairs, which wasn't thought about, you know, wasn't thought about by the club at all. So, yeah, mm -hmm. that's, 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 without mentioning names and things, that's the example that I have, yeah. It's a good point you mentioned, Jason, too, because, you know, knowing that club, they do a lot of promotional work about their disability football programs. They're yeah. very proud of it. Yeah. And they make a, you know, and there's some good work there. Yep, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Example contribution. Just, just to build on that, I think you know what, what's what's illustrative is that um, you know when it comes when it comes to say spectators, we've kind of covered a lot, you know a lot of those issues around um, Sylvia being forced into kind of passive, passive or de or dependent uh, positions and roles, um, and a lack of kind of engagement within uh, the broader issues associated with with um, fan fan interaction and fan engagement. And I suppose what that kind of highlights is the the underlying assumptions made that the um, the significance of the disabled person is to just talk on disability issues. So, for example, you know, you see, um, uh, yeah, the 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 the, the particular uh, representation of disabled people often is associated with uh, civil supporters groups. It may be associated with the disability liaison offices within football clubs, and it doesn't necessarily you know, transcend or go out, go out beyond those kind of parameters. And when it does, it's it's seen as a kind of novelty, or it's seen as a as a possibility. You know, going back to that idea of the kind of gift model, it gives it, it gives the sales person an opportunity to do something different, you know, and that that makes everybody feel you know good about themselves, and it makes the club have a have a good image in terms of um, in terms of its uh, uh, corporate imagery. Um, and again, you know, I, I can think of you know anecdotal information. I remember. Uh, talking to a, 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 a disabled person who had a background in analytics and he was employed by a football club uh, in the Premier League to be an analyst for their, for their team to, to review the data from games. Um, and as a disabled person with a visible impairment, he told me that he never felt taken, he was never taken seriously by uh, management, by coaching staff, because they thought that actually as a disabled person, his views were not credible. His experiences were not were, were therefore not credible. Um, I, 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 you know, I can see this personally as well. When I was, I did my um, my refereeing badges uh, with, with, uh, in in the local area, and again all the way through my refereeing course, you could see the utter kind of bemusement by fellow referees, um, by the by the teachers as well. Okay, they were quite accessible and inclusive, but you could all, you could you know they were always kind of making comments about. So what kind of role are you going to have then? Miro in terms of refereeing um, and again you know after the, after doing the course there was no kind of follow-up of support to, to find any opportunity to engage in in, um, in 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 refereeing within within the football because it was always seen as well you know as a sailor person you're not going to be taken seriously and this is why I think it you know we, we need to think more broadly about this issue and this is where studies and ableism I think is, is quite significant here 
because ableism studies offer that you know critique of of the ways in which psychological social economic cultural uh, imaginary or, or you know technology technological conditions create a, a privileged normative way of living so you know they they create that kind of uh, idolization of of able-bodiedness they it's, it's a cherishment uh, of particular forms of 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 health and physicality um and of course that then leads to a normative way of being an, an assumed desirable way of functioning and being and disabled people as we've kind of talked through you know since we started this at 11 o'clock disabled people through the social model through their activism disrupt normative ways of being which is deeply problematic then to the systems and structures that have built uh, the continuation and and the, and the reproduction of their of their operations on the basis of normalizing the body on the basis of creating desirability within uh, functional capacity. Um, so what happens when you have disabled people trying to disrupt that? Well, you get you know, the obvious examples of exclusion, of trying to minimize the credibility, the reliability, the worth of the individual. And I think you can see that in examples where disabled people have tried to break out of that uh, role of just being stuck positioned in disability discourse and trying to offer something you know beyond that uh, whether that's you know refereeing whether that's uh, examples of, of of analytics i remember a couple of years ago seeing such a uh, kind of media frenzy about uh, a wheelchair user who was doing his coaching badges you know at the, and again it's that kind of view of um you know the only way to be a credible successful useful uh, coach or management is that you have to be able to be like for like the players or the people who are exp or who are performing uh, the specified role uh, when it comes to say you know uh, you know football and 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 athleticism athleticism and now that you see changes in the way of uh, of clubs being managed now you see changes in the way that refereeing takes place the the emphasis placed on on data uh, analytics within uh, within management and within coaching there are numerous opportunities now for sale people to illustrate that they don't have to be confined to just talking about disability issues and actually there are opportunities in developing um, knowledge and expertise and skills in other areas can allow for uh, more, more broader representation and positions within the football industry and within the football system again that doesn't discount the input the significance of privilege that paul's talked about you know again you know the likelihood is that actually those who are able to navigate the barriers within higher education or the education system, those who are able to navigate the barriers of poverty and reduce life chances within their community will be able to afford these positions. And there will be numerous disabled communities that don't get any of these opportunities that we're talking about when it comes to involvement. But I think this is where you know, studies in ableism do provide us with a useful way of, of trying to make sense why this is happening. And of course, it's usually men, masculine, masculine versions of normality as well. So, you know, but that's all in there as well. So just to add to that point as well, I, I just it came to my mind that I remember when I was in school, I was actually in special school. So I, that's where I started. And uh, I remember uh, just before I was leaving to go to college, I had a conversation with my careers advisor who was sort of trying to direct me in a specific way, trying to direct me towards more office-based, ICT-based jobs and careers and for study as well, which I resisted because it wasn't what I wanted to do. I wanted to study sports. I wanted to, I wanted to coach. I wanted to be involved in the sports industry. And they were very keen on me not taking that path purely because of my, of my physical status as a, as a disabled, physically disabled person. That was, you know, that was purely the, their their stance on that they didn't believe that I had the the physical attributes to cope with that level of education or in, or future employment, which again is it comes down to the sort of ableism and that whole attitude of the way people don't see things in our way, um, and I think that obviously if if I went with that path I wouldn't be talking to you guys now, I wouldn't be uh, you know I wouldn't have been in university and things like that doing the courses that I did, I wouldn't have my coaching badges. So, you know, I think, obviously I'm glad that I resisted that, but I also feel that even though I have these qualifications and achievements, 
I have noticed with my own club that I that, that I, I run and I'm chairperson of, I've noticed that when we get people coming into the club, they don't speak to me first. Which is such a simple thing, such a simple thing. But because I'm in the wheelchair, they don't they don't speak to me first. I'm not the person in charge in their eyes. You know, and that's not something that uh, that's not something that non-disabled people see often. That they just assume that the, the the person that's walking around the sports hall is the person that's in charge. Whereas I'm the one that's setting up the session. I'm the one that's coaching the players. I'm the one with the session plan. And then I've had I've had you know experiences where people have been so embarrassed when they realise you know their you know their their thought process of you know you weren't the person in charge and you know and I'm not trying to make it some sort of power trip you know I don't, I don't mean it like that but you know it's just it's the, the, that respect thing you don't seem to get despite the fact that I've studied hard that I've got uh, UEFA level qualifications and things like that so you know I think it's important that it's emphasized that even if we do achieve these these great achievements and and, and, and set the bar high for disabled people we will always be up against this ableist sort of attitude. Thanks, Jack. I mean, that's a really, really fascinating and very sad to hear sort of point. Mm. Um, I, I, yeah, going back to the careers advisor one, I wonder if there's this idea of this protectionist sort of reflex to try and think, okay, well, let's save him from doing that. Heaven forbid he might fail. You know, this, you know, you've got, you're a disabled person, therefore you can't possibly fail. You know, it must be terrible for you. Yeah, that, that sort of approach. Um, if that's at careers level in schools, I mean, that's happening all around the advice on sporting pitches and things everywhere. Um, the idea also around this idea of the, the employability roles that say well, people are expected to take within sport. And, and I'm gonna, you know, I don't mean they're token roles, but I look at the idea of the disability liaison officer, uh, which has been around for a number of years before the disability access officer, which UA for yeah. you a few years ago, and how that somehow pressures down the DLO role. Uh, I wonder where DLO could go with the role and progress. You know, there's a, a place and that's the one place. And then once you progress from that, you stay in the club or go elsewhere. I mean, that idea of how those protectionist attitudinal barriers, you know, come to be in the workplace, I, I think is fascinating. So there's a lot of work can be done to try and increase opportunities. But even once we increase the numbers of people working in the workplace, they they face other barriers that many of us don't. Um, yeah, I think that's a you know, sad but you know interesting thing to, to focus on. Um, it's not just about more opportunities, it's about changing the the you know the, the notions that you talked about the ableism uh, within the workplace. I mean, I, I think that's you know very very interesting in terms of the way that you know we look at involvement and the problematic nature of involvement in sport. I mean. With an eye on the clock, we might look to move on to you know, the, the third part, if I'm not cutting anybody off, around this idea of opportunities that are coming from um, from these sort of discussions, things around our way of, of examining football and things should be done differently. Um, we could see uh, you know, two key areas that we might focus on. One, you know, opportunities for action, but also then maybe later we talk about opportunities for research and we can widen that discussion to anyone. Anyone want to start off with is some ideas for um, for action, things that can be done differently, uh, that hopefully address some of these these issues? Start me, sure. right? Okay, so I'll go first. Well, I think, you know, building on Paul Kitchen, what you were saying just then about, um, you know, the, 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 the specific roles associated with disability um, within football clubs. One thing I think would be useful is to actually see more relationships between disabled people's organizations, centers for independent living um, and football clubs. You know, we've seen a real emphasis on the role of community when it comes to football clubs and the worth being um, judged on the basis of how involved is the club within the local community. Um, and as we've said before, when it comes to disability, often that is overtly tragic and overtly medicalized, um, which again, is not only problematic, it's also harmful as well to representation of disability because we, we must recognize that when we are seeing repeated messages of triumph over adversity, repeated messages of tell people are, are, are a point of voyeurism, a point of curiosity, a point of uh, you know, feeling good about yourself by doing something to assist a sale person probably in the wrong way. This doesn't just actually um, disrupt our kind of path towards sale people's emancipation 
um, and more broadly speaking, their inclusion, accessibility in society. It also pushes us back as well. And you can see that you know, on the basis of uh, austerity measures, on the basis of how disabled people are represented in, in, in media narratives today. So what I'd like to see you know, as a point of action is to develop stronger and closer links between the disabled people's organizations and Centers for Independent Living, which, which is a, a, a kind of broad term used to define organizations that are controlled and led by disabled people. Um, and Centers for Independent Living are organizations controlled and led by disabled people who are focused on the notion of independent living. Um, and again, you know, independent living, just for context, doesn't mean doing things for yourself on your own, which kind of reinforces that kind of ableist and, and self-sufficiency narrative that we've been questioning today. Uh, the disabled people's movement globally acknowledged and articulated independent living to mean the right level of support to do the things you want to do with your life. Um, so I'd, I'd like to see a stronger move away from engaging with traditional disability charities, charities that reinforce that charitable notion of, of gift um, and tragedy when it comes to disability, uh, which are also deeply harmful to the uh, uh, agendas and demands and strategies of the disabled people's movement and engage with local or regional DPOs and CALs to not only direct attention towards the social model of disability, but also to politicize disability and recognize that disability is a, is a, is a discussion around social injustice and placing emphasis um, and, and scrutiny on the systems and practices and individuals who are responsible for the way that society is organized uh, or how society is continuously produced in a, in a way to deny sell people opportunities and to exclude them. I think that would be really useful and it would also be a way of kind of, kind of strengthening um, the, 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 the significance of disability politics. And I think more broadly speaking, you know, we want to see more relationships between disabled supporters groups and the broader activism uh, associated with, with, with footballing fans who are committed and engaged in issues of austerity, poverty, issues of, um, of uh, marginalization of, 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 of various groups within the communities. You know, again, this might be a little bit abstract and I won't talk about it too much, but you know, disabled people's movement, disability activism is only going to be um, significant going forward if it engages more broadly with the way in which people as a whole are positioned in precarious and detrimental uh, positions within society. So I think you know, much more linking up of, of different groups to bring disability within the dominant and majority discourse surrounding inclusion, participation of, of disenfranchised and, and disengaged communities would be a useful starting point. Whether you do that from a top-down or, or bottom-up approach, I think is up for debate. And I think sometimes it's, it's, it's problematic when you, you go for the top and you ask for the FA or the, you know, the EFL and, and so on to have more of a responsibility in trying to create this. Uh, it, never, it never leads to any organic uh, meaningful action. One could argue it leads to kind of corrupted, bastardized approaches to participation and inclusion, which is deeply problematic. But the other side is if you leave it to the grassroots, often you just ignore disability because it requires a level of resources. It requires a way of doing things very differently that many groups just don't have the resources or the time or the, or the interest to do so. Yeah, I, would, I would agree. And I think, I think you need to come at it from all angles. I think you're right. You can't just leave it to, to grassroots. But equally, I think it is about trying to identify champions from a politicized view of disablement in the sense that often lots of, lots of players have disabled children and they quickly get sucked in to that notion of the charity model. Uh, I think, uh, you know, particularly they'll get sucked into their impairment charity in particular. And I think it's about, and this is the role of something like the Football Collective for me uh, and the role of academia in articulating alternatives to the profession and to the hierarchies within the structures of football, that there is an alternative, that it doesn't have to be that, and it can be, actually be a lot more progressive and, and, dare I say it, profitable. If you constantly see one group in a very narrow way, you're limiting their engagement and your engagement with them, and it has an enormous potential to be so much more than that. And I think a good example is, is women's football, 
is gone on a similar route. It's still got a long way to go because it's still uh, male dominated. But actually the strides that has made have, have been incredible, which, which, you know, I would have said 10, 15 years ago, I wouldn't have thought we would be where we are now. And I think that's the same with disabled people. And, and given that so many football clubs have disability teams at all levels that are competitive, and it's about encouraging to, to expand that so that actually that they have the opportunity to play. And I think this is where, again, the football collective through influencing governing bodies, influencing government to create that notion of an alternative perspective and an alternative model of practice that can be much more utilitarian, much more effective engaging a broader sector of society as it has with women with women's soccer women's football and i think that which is exceptional it's brilliant but they've escaped from that to some extent not completely obviously uh but i think that that is a model that we need to follow so you start getting to get the 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 trainers for the club women's clubs being women uh there's still a lot of resistance to that particularly when you get higher levels of competition that they still have this narrow masculine view of what success means and I, and I think but it also goes back to schools having inclusive school teams for example I think is very important that you educate people at different levels on on the potential of what football can be in transforming lives on many many levels political personal physical uh, one of the things, you know, I, as a disabled person, I'm against segregated education. But one of the ironies of that, for example, on a kind of personal level is I went to a, a very segregated school. It was specifically for my impairment, which was spina bifida and hydrocephalus. But we played, we had a football team. Uh, we had people in wheelchairs in goal, loads of us on crutches. We played normal schools, which was, in retrospect, was insane. They used to beat us like 33-5, uh, but it was an amazing experience for me personally in, in playing football, competitive football. We were always going to get thrashed. It didn't matter to us. What we mattered was is that we played football. And, and my brothers who went to a local comprehensive, they didn't play football because they weren't in the higher echelons of the team. So it was, it was something that escaped them. And I, I, I ended up being so lucky in going to a special school despite the fact i'm completely against them and i think that there's segregation etc but i think that playing participating and influencing the structures through alternative models through academia through research is is in a way the key for me in changing the whole landscape of of football and disabled people just, just building on that as well is also uh, you, you mentioned Paul of of participating uh, football again. Jogging my memory, I in primary school I was all I went to a mainstream primary school, and I was always chosen. Uh, I was the first team goalkeeper, always chosen because my wheelchair blocked the entire goal, so nobody nobody could ever be, no, could, could ever score against me. Um, but I think yeah, what what's interesting about this conversation is that actually it depends on what is trying to be achieved, and I think that's that's. It's important that we reflect on the aims and objectives of not, not just this conversation, but those who are engaged in thinking about inclusion, inclusivity, and accessibility of football. If we, you know, it, they are they are different things. On the one hand, to talk about the opportunity to engage in playing sport, and again, you know, the international mixability sports uh, group and their manifesto on membership and belonging, on breaking down barriers, on on um, inclusion within sport is, you know, is, is quite interesting. I think it gives us a level of, of grounding into how to move towards um, ensuring that the actual opportunity to participate in the sporting, in the sport itself, in the athleticism itself is, 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 is essential. But that's different to thinking about how football um, as, a, you know, as, a kind of, as a kind of broad um, area of, of discussion can also allow us to advance disabled people's emancipation and to try to tackle some of those political, economic, cultural issues that we've been talking about. And I think sometimes we kind of, you know, 
we, we become a little bit muddled in the conversations. I don't mean today, but I mean in general in the discourse. You see, you know, a lot of people talk about accessibility and inclusion within fo uh, within football or sport, and they're talking specifically about disabled people having the opportunity to participate in the actual sport. Um, you know, and I think that's different from thinking about how do we use football, how do we use the people who are working in football, the policy making, the discussions, the platforms for change, to think more broadly about the position of disabled people in society and use football as a conduit or as a way to facilitate communication and action to address the marginalizing and oppressive tendencies that, um, that kind of reflect disabled people's everyday experiences. And again, I think, I think, for example, women's football has done that. Uh, it, it's tapped into other issues, uh, honour killing, uh, equally in, inequities in pay, through having champions that have championed social and political concepts around that. And Black Lives Matter is, is doing that as well through sport as well. Football, uh, Formula One, they're all doing that. And I think it's about getting, up, getting disabled people and disabled people's movements and politics up to that level and, and I think one of the things we do need are our champions uh, and they're, they're hard to come by when we don't have that kind of high profile uh, but again that's I think where someone like the football collective can come in and something like you know affecting the FA and equally the funds research from something like the football football collective affecting and leading and feeding into uh, Premier League funding for uh, community or charity activity within the community. I think, for example, the, the local team here, they've just got a Premier League grant of, you know, an extortion amount of money about disability. And it's, it's fairly rooted within a kind of dis disabling model. But actually, it's not really their fault because they don't know any better. Uh, and, and that's where something like you, us, are so important. I think that's sort of important too, when, when you see that society in general, I think there's a fear of disability within society and within football, a fear of the unknown, because the majority within football and society in general don't understand disability, they don't understand the barriers, they don't understand the function of disability, they, don't underst they just don't get it. A lot of the time, and I think there there is a real fear in terms of becoming more inclusive and what that might bring for society and for football, and in terms of f a financial fear as well. I think there is a real fear of, you know, when you try to make things more inclusive, it's going to cost money. You know, it's it's a simple argument of football is a business, and, and, and money is what makes football and society go round at the end of the day. And if it's going to cost money to make things more inclusive, to improve things so, uh, socially for uh, a disabled person or for the disabled population, that is that you know that's a, a huge uh, that's a huge argument in terms of is there going to be is is that the, the biggest barrier? It could be because you know financially that's what that that's what drives football. That's what drives society is money. So I think there's a real fear of inclusivity becoming expensive essentially as well as the fact as as we've said as well just generally of disabilities being unknown and the challenges and the difficulties and how to change and become more inclusive that you know i think that's uh, that's a big part of the problem as well and i think just just building up on jason's point i think there's you know there's two really important things coming out of that on the one hand you've got this recognition of well if we want things to be done differently so often those who are inside the system feel um, kind of accosted or judged to say, well, are you saying that I, you know, I, for, for years I've been doing it wrong or I've been contributing towards still people's marginalization? Yeah. And you can see, you know, if you think about the changes, and again, you know, I know we're going a little bit abstract, but if you think about the changes within health and social care policy, the, the, the move towards more personalized care, you know, still people having more choice of control over how they receive the support, you see such resistance particularly at a local bureaucratic level, because you've got social workers, commissioners saying, you know, if, for me to, to acknowledge that actually we want to do things differently means that I've contributed towards the problems for, you know, for, for so long. So I think, you know, how do we strategically get 
clubs, administrators, governors, you know, decision makers to acknowledge that actually they have been doing things which have contributed towards um, the, 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 uh, the marginalization of disabled people. But rather than actually engage in a, in a hostile critical sense, what we're trying to offer as disabled scholars, activists, uh, committed you know, uh, 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 participants within, within sporting arenas, what we're trying to do is create the change and try to imagine the, you know, those, 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 um, those alternative possibilities that may be much more beneficial, not just to disabled people participating in football, but to people being part of their communities more broadly within society. But I think the other point as well, just to quickly acknowledge, uh, which I think is key, is, is the role of capitalism and how to link capitalism to the context of disability to the context of football. You know, whilst I, you know, I'm, I, you know, there, is, there, is a, there is a groundswell of, of activists and, and scholars within disability studies who articulate how cap capitalism is fundamentally problematic for disabled people, some would argue that you know, by getting rid of capitalism, you've addressed the problem with disability. I think that's quite naive. But what's important is recognizing that how the, 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 the principles and the aspirations of capitalism, or indeed you know, more contemporary examples of neoliberalism, how they problematize disability as well. Because you know, going back to school, our education system as a sale person is problematic because as you go through the education system, you're trying to gear up and be prepared to enter the labor market. But for a lot of employers, they don't want to employ sale people because it costs. It will cost resources. It will take away from profits and so on. So absolutely, that role of the relationship between capitalist intentions, football industry, and then the, the experience of the sale people who need radical overhaul of systems and structures and opportunities to try to get anywhere near to what we've been talking about in terms of the visualizing change, positive change, positive social change for sale people does have to take into account those questions of, 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 of the economy and economic objectives of football and more broadly speaking, um, governments and, and community groups. Excellent, Mira. I mean, uh, that leads us on really nicely into you know, the ideas for, for future research. So things that we've been throwing around from our very much non-disabled sort of, uh, you know, research point of view is only trying to develop a business case for inclusion. Um, uh, and, and showing the increasing value of uh, the disability market, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I mean, you're going back to your points on people seeing themselves as part of the problem. I mean, if we go back to the social model, then that naturally puts us as the oppressors, um, because if you know, social model views uh, people being oppressed, um, we are then naturally oppressed by you know, naturally oppressed by someone, and that includes the non disabled population. So. It is, it is that challenge, um, you know, so in that sort of context, how do we start to create you know, a business case, a rational case, or is that the right approach? I, I think it can be the right approach. Uh, I, I think it's a multi, a multi layered approach. I think, for example, because it is a broader social issue about equality and marginalization, poverty, you know, all of those kind of things. And I know, for example, St. Pauli in Germany, and, and they're kind of like, a very progressive club. I, I'd like to know how they deal with disability and inclusivity in a club like that. And highlighting models of good practice. I don't know how they do it, if they do it at all. But equally, I think, to me, it's also about, you know, I'm very interested in history. So, for example, you can see the picture behind me. That, that's Invercars. Uh, you know, when I was growing up, they were all around the football pitches of uh, mainstream clubs on television. You'd watch uh, Match of the Day and there'd be a couple of Invercars next to the pitch. And, and that kind of our own disabled history is often missing. Our own history as disabled fans is missing. Our own history as disabled players is missing. Because uh, there were disabled players with various impairments. You know, there's the, the one-armed World Cup winner. Uh, you know, who played for Germany in the 50s, you know, often coming out of a kind of the war veteran kind of thing. So I think there's, there's a whole level, in a way, there's a whole industry of research that can be undertaken to push this forward. Our disabled people's own history, the history of how clubs have seen disabled people, because often that's a fairly uh, unresearched area. And I think research is very important in identifying what was, what is, and then for, therefore what can be. Uh, and I think we haven't really done that much on any of it. There are good examples uh, and, and looking at 
you know, visual impairment. I know Jess has done stuff, et cetera, and other people that I think is really essential, but I think it's, it's engaging in disabled people much more that's important and equally ensuring that it gets the right people in the right way at all levels of the game. And just, you know, I'm building on that. I think it would be interesting to look at where are the windows of opportunity for whether that's clubs, whether that's uh, fan orientated uh, networks, where they can provide accessible and inclusive spaces to bring together still people and others who are interested in the way in which football is organized and football operates and to question and, and, and explore the alternative visions for that. You know, going back to studies in ableism, what ableism acknowledges is that it wants to close down opportunities to imagine alternatives because, you know, there is a desire, you know, for many of people who are, hold those positions of authority and influence, they want to keep things the way they do for, for you know, for various uh, objectives and, and aims. So realizing alternatives, which may then cause disruption, are seen as, as, as problematic. So we have to think about where are the opportunities to allow there to be accessible, safe spaces for disabled people and those communities who have also experienced you know, levels of, of significant injustice to come together to realize alternative forms of not only participation and inclusion, but also questions of ownership and belonging as well. You know, we've seen with, with, the, with, the, chat, with the kind of broader political challenges around neoliberalism and the neoconservative agendas, austerity measures and so on, you're seeing much more national and international progressive alliances come out questioning the ideas of the commodification of various aspects of, of daily life, questioning ideas of, of, uh, of you know, forms of, um, of local authority budgeting, uh, commissioning of services, uh, organization of community groups and so on. I think you know, there's, a, there's a real opportunity to cement the experiences and the people who are engaged in critiquing and, and analyzing and scrutinizing football and the accessibility and the inclusion of football and link that to those broader conversations surrounding the political, economic, cultural discourses surrounding marginalization, belonging, ownership. But I'd also like to go a little bit you know, broader than that as well in terms of research and look at where are the existing problems in the system uh, which, which contribute to the levels of injustice, that contribute to pushing back the kind of agendas and issues that we've been talking about. You know, so often, you know, we talked about disabled people's representation and positions within, within influential bodies. Uh, but the other, you know, the other side of that coin is that there are many disabled people who occupy those opportunities of influence who are deeply harmful to the ideas that we've been talking about. You know, so often you see, uh, just, I mean, again, it's anecdotal, but if you look at the, the, the uh, position of, of former uh, Paraly Paralympians, Many of, many of them don't talk about disability as a social justice issue, don't talk about it from a social model point of view. You, know, you had the likes of Tanya Gray Thompson, but actually the majority of those who have kind of engaged in those public discourses often reinforce that medicalized, uh, medicalization of the body, often reinforce that elitism associated with um, you know, human capacity. Uh, so it's also questioning and producing the research to illustrate these are the key problems in the existing way that we engage with sale people, that we provide sale people opportunities to influence. Because not every sale person is a politicized sale person. Not every sale person will articulate disability as a form of injustice, which, you know, obviously I am biased in assuming that that's a, that, that is the, the way in which we address these issues. Obviously, there will be other people who do disagree with that fundamentally. Um, but I, you know, I would also like to think about how does various aspects of the football experience undermine those, uh, that disability culture that we've been talking about, you know, the, the significance of um, solidarity, the significance of accessibility and the inclusion. So what, in what ways do, does the, you know, the ableist notion of physical health, of psychological health, um, you know, how do they recreate or subvert attention away from the issues that we're discussing, whether that's within you know, participation of fans, whether that's within opportunities of employability within the football system. There's you know, numerous ways of going about this. And I think, uh, you know, I think studies in ableism is, is one way of trying to link the, the, the studies in football and the discussions around uh, the, what comes out of the literature within those uh, subject areas 
and linking that to the disability studies. There is examples of linking disability studies to, you know, the, you know, the more general sports associated studies, but I think you know, more can be done on that. And I think there's a real, there's a real gap in the existing literature of trying to marry those two disciplines and fields of study together. We had a couple of people on the call as well who are sort of researching these areas as well. So we might call on them in the questions when we come to that as well. But, um, but just keep an eye on the time as well, just to make sure everyone's um, able to manage their own sort of equipments. Uh, not to single anyone out, but do anyone want some final comments around this opportunity for research or, you know, I can move towards questions and that could uh, encompass some of those as well. I, I suppose I would say, I think that the, the COVID-19 crisis could provide opportunities uh, for change, because I think there's going to be a lot of social problems that are resulting from that poverty, marginalisation across the board, not just particularly disabled people, that will need to be a challenge for football clubs. The age of football fans is getting older and older who participate, who, who go to football. I think I read in uh, one magazine, the average football fan is now about 47, the average age. And so, and I think there's opportunities to see engaging in the kind of the disability debate at all levels can transform the game to be much more successful within its own narratives if it can just get over its normative gaze and its ablest attitudes and i think there's enormous potential there just to just to build on that actually it's it's an interesting point that paul makes because uh, obviously, with the, the COVID-19 pandemic and stuff, it has really changed everyone's mindset in terms of how society can function and how society can work. So I think it's an important argument as well that in terms of the employability of a disabled person can be, the capability of that can be more diverse than what was maybe previously thought. Because, for example, we're sitting here now in a, in a, in a Zoom call to do this. Um, and I don't think there have been many jobs in the past before COVID-19 where you could actively work from home, for example, you know, to, to achieve that job. So th th there are options out there for disabled people who maybe can't go into an office five days a week, you know, or maybe have other, other different, uh, different disabilities and different difficulties, which cause them to need to do their job slightly differently than what a non-disabled person would do. So there are options out there to make things more inclusive, to make things more adaptable for disabled people in general, whether that be in football or whether that be in society in general. And I think this is a real opportunity to reset for society now in terms of what disabled people can have in terms of a more inclusive and diverse environment that they can work in and adapt with. And I think if if we can sort of use this, obviously terrible, it's a terrible uh, global situation, uh, and utilize it to come out to the other side of it better for disabled people, I think it's an opportunity that if if we if we let it pass and we just go back to the way we were before that, I think that's you know that would be a real shame, and I think that's great. Obviously, that we have this sort of platform now to to raise those types of opinions because more of this also needs to happen as well you know more of this sort of discussion and, and discourse in terms of disabilities in football and sports and society you know the more that we can do this and the more that we can engage with with non-disabled people with governing bodies with governments you know whatever it is uh, the more we can help enact this inclusion and change so i think this uh, platform has obviously been great for that as well so yeah that's just my two cents on on paul's take there Thank you, thank you, gents, for, uh, for those inputs as well. Um, yeah, I think there's a few of us all sort of doing bits and pieces around uh, COVID-19 and, and disability and sport at the moment, and those are, those issues have been discussed. Um, there's also a fear that you know the, already we're seeing returns to work and to sport, and they're very much in the old-fashioned way, uh, without due consideration. But there are a number of people trying to write, you know, or do bits and make contributions to that. Um, so they want to welcome inputs. Um, Look, gentlemen, thanks very much for your, your, your thoughts and opinions. I found that a really fascinating uh, discussion, even though I knew what was coming up in the sort of schedule. I mean, it was still excellent in terms of the, the, the complexity. And I think there's also aspects on there that I hadn't considered uh, before. Um, 
especially power and national privilege uh, within disability. I knew there was issues around the idea of diversity of, of um, a disability, uh, but of course how that's sort of seen in football and a, good uh, a space of privilege for disabled people uh, could be something to, to, to focus on as well. What I'd like to do, if anyone has some, I have a couple of questions uh, already come in, but people like to email me or to Pete um, the questions they might have, uh, I'll ask them and then the panel might fit to respond, uh, suit to respond. But my, my first one is more functional, um, yeah, and I'm gonna offer it myself. Uh, we mentioned importantly that the diversity of disabled people within sports organizations is not very diverse. I think uh, every sort of paper I've read on the topic has all said that, and I've written it myself about increasing the diversity um, in, in decision-making um, in disability. Not having great familiarity with disabled people's organisations and also the independent living movement. Are there ways where uh, either of you have seen uh, where this diversity ha has been achieved? And, and step towards that, that might be useful in football? I would say probably more in the cultural sector. I yeah. think in, in arts, in the arts sector, mm -hmm. theatres, venues, organisations up and down the country, often dependent on some form of state funding or some kind of public funding through the Arts Council, the lottery. I think they're probably offering a, a good model of practice by and large, in the sense that it be it it has become a requirement of funding, and I think not to the degree I would re I think it should be done. Uh, with, there's the lack of penalties for those that don't deliver on it, particularly, particularly in arts and culture. But I think it does offer a good opportunity, and again, there is that opportunity within football, given that they do receive public funding, they do receive grant funding from the Premier League. Uh, broadcasters etc engage in it so I, I would say particularly in, in Britain the Arts Councils of England Scotland and Wales and, and uh, Northern Ireland as well their participation in ensuring diversity is is quite exceptional and considerable compared I would say to probably any other sector okay no, I, I'd, I'd agree completely. I think, you know, what's significant as well about DPOs um, and Centre for Independent Living is that they don't, they don't become impairment specific. So they look to, uh, you know, acknowledge the, the variance in accessibility and the access needs of people. So typically, you know, effective uh, DPOs and CILs are those who don't prioritise impairment specifics over other groups and recognize that actually they need to provide various resources. There are some you know, particular groups um, associated with, let's say, for example, learning disabilities, um, who are kind of politically active on the rights and participation of people with learning disabilities. People like Learning Disability England, uh, People First, or, you know, organizations that are run by and for disabled people, um, and, and try to prioritize the, the significance of, of, of access needs for, for, for people with learning disabilities. I also think it's it's a question about how accessible our resources are and when we're putting out calls for opportunities for people to participate. We have to think of, you know, the 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 uh, various factors associated with participation, not just in terms of having interest in the issue, but also thinking about um, the level of support that's required for an individual to participate, the level of accessibility to actually engage somewhere. Also thinking about the, the way in which systems and structures have told disabled people over the years, your voice is, is meaningless. Your ideas are meaningless. You know, you don't have any credibility to your ideas. You know, I, I work a lot in, in, um, in social policy uh, anal uh, analysis. Um, and when I see local authorities say, right, we, we, you know, we've got disabled people that we engage with in the community. Um, but we want to make it more, you know, more diverse in, in kind of membership and representation. And I say, well, but yeah, but for years, social workers, practitioners have been saying, so people's voices are redundant to the demands and expectations of practitioners and professionals. So there's also a question of how do we provide accessible ways of ensuring that people feel that they do have a voice that matters. 
and particularly you know groups people with mental health con uh, conditions people with lend disabilities these are groups that have often been told that their voice doesn't matter or their voice can only be um uh kind of legitimized by the views of non sale people or by the views of professionals so i think we also have to kind of incorporate that into our analysis of of op opportunities for having much more diverse mm -hmm. variants within representation of, of the groups that we're talking about and, and equally the exploitation of groups who give them who give who vocalize the views that they want to hear that facilitate the marginalization and oppression I, I think that that they're very good at that I think local authorities are very good at that you know and often Nero said often they say we want to make it a more diverse group that means they don't like what they're hearing from what you're saying from a very politicized, engaged way, and they want to dilute that through bringing in other groups to facilitate that they can do what they want. Uh, and it's about having an awareness that and, and identifying that to be able to challenge that to ensure that a more effective message is delivered and, and accessed by all those who, who we want to access it. Gosh, thank you for that. Um, apologies for um, uh, the timing here. I haven't managed this very effectively. But uh, we've got a, a quick question there from Guy um, on the on the uh, on the list. I don't know if we can see it, but uh, it asks, "How is it possible to bring disability barriers more to the front, but to look at the barriers as a whole and not only at physical barriers? Any practical ideas?" I, I suppose I would say it is about trying to ensure the kind of politicization. And I, I don't mean like party philosophy. I mean like by simply getting across the social model. Just so many disabled people don't know what the social model is uh, themselves, let alone the organizations and all of those kind of things. And to understand that it is, it's a way of life. It's not just about building a ramp. It's about engaging with disabled people on so many levels. And I, and I think there is, there is good examples of that in clubs, particularly premiership clubs who have the money and the desire to engage in that kind of corporate responsibility in, in getting disabled teams together to participate in a more equitable way. It's still way down the bottom, obviously. But I think the way that women have achieved the success that they have with women's football in going up and up and up, for example, the, the local Premier League team for me, for example, up until this year, the women's team had to pay to play for that team. And it is only this year that the club, which is possibly one of the second richest clubs in the world, have decided that the women don't have to pay to play for that club. That is astounding, which I think is just amazing. But there's an opportunity there on an increasing using that as a model to engage on a whole new level with 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 football uh, at all levels. I think you got to turn your microphone on. Me. Sorry, yeah, and I think just building on that as well. Yeah, you know, looking at looking at something as significant as the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Disabled People is a useful way of actually trying to organize some of the discussions around what we expect uh, as disabled people when it comes to accessibility and inclusion and participation you yeah, the, the the significance of un conventions is that is that they're written aspirational so they 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 inform a citizen um or a member of a member state of what you expect to experience if a country was to uh sign up to or abide or or enforce the convention within its legislation and some of the commentaries, if you go on the United Nations Convention of Disabled People's website, you have the general comments by the committee. Um, they have comments on inclusive education, uh, independent living, but what they do is they provide examples as to how to make things, uh, how to realize a convention within local, regional, national infrastructure. And I think looking at, you know, combing through the convention, obviously some of it does talk about access to recreational activities, access to leisure, access, access to um, you know, community participation. But I think combing through the legislation, combing through the general comments and the advice can give disabled people and their organizations, those who are politicized as, as, as Paul's just talked about, it gives us a way then of actually offering an alternative vision 
because you know so often we'll get we'll get trapped into saying you know this is what's this is what the problem is then you know the responsibility you know from the from the oppressors if we kind of look at it superficially this is what needs to, you know what do you want to change we offer an alternative vision it can't be realized it's never been done but by looking at the kind of international examples and looking at the the discourse coming from disabled people's organizations about how to realize those specific conventions articles of the convention i think is a useful way of trying to advance some of uh, some of the things that we've been talking about because you know, building on from what jason said before whilst there's a, there are opportunities within the kind of pandemics to do things differently uh, there's also the problem of being left behind and there's a real danger that there's going to be further disparity between those who can get on and function within the the new normal inverted commas which is a horrible phrase but those who actually get trapped and left behind and abandoned because society hasn't attempted to accommodate their needs acknowledge the implications of their health and impairments in relation to a global pandemic and the way in which society then is organized so i think there is going to be you know much more um pushback against the ideas that we've had today because clubs uh, influencers uh, governors of, of of the different bodies that we've been highlighting they are in precarious situations and they're terrified of you know their capital of their wealth and so on and as we talked about before the kind of relationship between econo econ economics and, and football and, and participation this is going to create further precariety and, and 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 danger for groups who are struggling to survive and engage and participate so we've got to be ready to offer an, uh, the alternative but also ensure that those demands can be um it can be part of a continuum of pressure otherwise it's very easy that we're going to be told well the things that you're demanding the things that you want are just not possible because we've got to prioritize other things and we're already seeing that when it comes to economic productivity we're already seeing that when it comes to herd immunity stealth uh, by stealth and so on there's real dangers when it comes to sale people's position within society and i think some of those dangers will be reflected in, in football as well i think one of the dangers is is we've got to we get a bit caught up it's going to cost money. Football is not a profitable business for virtually anyone. Uh, there's virtually no football clubs that makes money. They are exercises in other things. And one of the things I think that it's important that we do is to get across that one of the important things to include in that exercise is the value of disabled people and the role of engaging disabled people themselves with football in a way that's more than just fandom and i think that is a weakness that we have in the movement in in the politics of disablement is that we don't exploit and utilize football like we should uh as as other groups have as, as other marginalized and political groups have uh in, in a way that i think we need to do much more it's funny because I, I did a discussion on disability in the media a, a while ago and everyone was going on about how, you know, we've got to make quality product. It's so important that it's, it's really good. And I said, well, why? What most people make in media is crap. What we want is the right to make as much crap as they do. <laughs> Some of it might be good, but a lot of it will be crap. Just like most of what they make is crap. Don't trap ourselves in these illusions that we have to be better and we have to do this at a higher level we don't we've just got to get in there and be doing it as a starting point and that that to me is very very important jason did you have a point you wanted to, to come in there on or? yeah no i just wanted to add it may, maybe maybe quite a simple point in comparison but i just think it's important for in terms of bringing barriers to the front just to get back to the, the question it's in terms of bringing barriers to the forefront, I think it's actually important that some of the barriers that we as disabled people face are highlighted to the relevant people who can actually make changes within society. You know, if it, it, needs, it needs to be, there needs to be more education in terms of not only the diversity of disability, but also the diversity of barriers that those people uh, face, no matter what your disability or impairment may be. Obviously, it, it, it seems like a blatantly obvious point, but sometimes it's these types of obvious things that people often miss. 
you know, people need to know what the problems are and they need to know why the problems are there for them to be fixed. So I think that's a very simple but important point that education to authorities, to the general public, to society needs to be continued and needs to be increased in terms of the diversity of disability and the diversity of the barriers that we face and why those barriers exist. And obviously then to find solutions that are, that are realistic and cost effective to, uh, to help remove those barriers. Jess, thank you very much. And, and, and James, thanks so much for a really fascinating discussion. Um, I, uh, once again, apologies for you know, running the time over a bit, but I thought that was uh, important to have that space to discuss these things at length. And I think that from the questions not asked, which I'll make sure that the, the speakers get after, uh, there's a, a quite a few there uh, looking at this idea around um, you know, negotiating access and, and managing, uh, managing organisations to become much more inclusive, how other industries seem to do it and maybe the, the, the football does not so um yeah thank you very much for your time and that was a, a terrific session and uh, as i mentioned in the comments to some as well this would be a, a first step i mean the the, the, the selection of the, ch the topic disability and football was broad enough to then be able to um in encounter a number of topics we might come from this uh to include you know make sure that in this online webinar series you know that the football collective has a, a decent representation of uh, disability discussions around the sport um, and of course, you'd all be invited and, uh, along to the next ones to ha have a think. And there's some other people as well. We want to get involved in those as well. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Of course. Thanks very much. Have enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you, Jason. Yeah, thanks, Paul and Myra. Uh, really appreciate the, the efforts you made. Um, Pete, do I hand back to you or are you? Uh... Um, I'll just very briefly just remind those who are in the audience. Well, first of all, I just want to thank you, Paul, and also the panelists the audience for just a thoroughly brilliant session. Um, on Wednesday, we've got our, ne our next session, which is on race, racism and racial injustices in football. Um, we've got um, Troy and Ose from Kick It Out on the panel that day. And we've also got Paul Campbell, the sociologist Paul Campbell on the panel that day too. So it promises to be another really, really good event. But thank you so much to those of you on the panel and to you for chairing today, Paul. Absolutely yeah. fantastic. Nice.